you have questions, the Bible has answers. This program, overseen by the Phillips Street Church of Christ, is dedicated to answering your questions with God's Word. Please join us for the period of study as we seek to give a Bible answer. And now, here is your moderator. Hello, everyone. Welcome once again to a Bible Answer. My name is Mike McDaniel, and I'm the evangelist of the Central Church of Christ in Carothersville, Missouri. Thanks for watching a Bible Answer today. Now, we have three gospel preachers, and they've been with us four weeks, but they're with us an additional week because there are five Sundays, as you know, in the month of July. And we'll have them introduce themselves to you once again. Hello, I'm Jeff Brown. I preach for the Pleasant Hill Church of Christ at Trenton, Tennessee. I'm Randall Evans with the Cady's Church of Christ in Cady's, Kentucky. I'm Johnny Mac Young. I work with the Brewston Church of Christ in Brewston, Tennessee. We're so grateful to these brethren for taking time out of their busy schedules to be with us to answer your questions. Let's get right to our questions today. Our first question of Brother Brown. Brother Brown, how does one grieve the Holy Spirit in the verse Ephesians 4.30? Brother Brown. Thank you for the question. This is a good question. I have enjoyed the study of this question. Let's read the verse together. There Paul writes, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Notice there that we are sealed unto the day of redemption by whom? The Holy Spirit of God is who seals us unto the day of redemption. And this question has to do with grieving the Holy Spirit. Before we go any further, let's notice or define the word grieve. Here this word grieve is used, is defined as to distress, to bring sadness upon, to cause grief, to be in heaviness, or to be sorrowed. And so we see there that, that to distress or to be in heaviness, to cause grief, upon there and it grieves the Holy Spirit when we do some things and we could go elsewhere looking at at some things that we could do to grieve the Holy Spirit but I believe the best place to notice this very idea would be stay in the context here at beginning back at verse 17 and continuing through verse uh, 29 then also verses 31 and 32 and notice some of the behaviors there that can be said to grieve the Holy Spirit Notice there, verse 17, the first one says, Paul writing here says this, I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as the Gentiles walk, as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. So the first thing that would grieve the Holy Spirit here we see is living in a characteristics of most of the Gentiles of that very day. And what was, what was that particularly there? They were walking in the vanity of their mind. They were walking after those things of the world. They were walking after their riches, their uh, personal affections, the affections of the world. They were worldly-minded people there. And notice there what Paul says, the vanity of their mind. Those things that are vain or, or vanity of mind, they're empty, they're void, they're waste. And no good can come from that when we think of spiritual matters there. And you also remember that this was the thing that Paul mentioned in Romans chapter 1, 18 through 32, about the, uh, uh, some of what they had done. They had changed the uh, word of God into a lie, that they had gone after that which was unnatural and unseemingly. They had turned uh, from the use of the women to men seeking after men and women after women also, and other uh, characteristics of the Gentiles of that day. But also there we see verse 18, that having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their hearts. Well, another thing that grieves the Holy Spirit is ignorance. Well, what was said of the people of Hosea's day that they were destroyed for what? Lack of knowledge. They were destroyed because they did not retain God in their knowledge and ignorance. Someone says ignorance is bliss. That's not what Paul says. Paul says that it grieves the Holy Spirit. But also there from verse 18, we see the blindness of their heart. What does it mean there? That their blindness of their heart means that they are not students of the Scriptures. They have uh, hardened their heart. They have closed their heart to the truth. 
and they have become alienated from the life of God, as the verse tells us there as well. What does it mean to be alienated from something? To be separated, to be departed from. They have departed from the life of God. But then notice there, verse uh, 19, another uh, thing that grieves the Holy Spirit. Who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to, walk, to work all uncleanness with greediness there. Their past feeling, their heart is so calloused that, that it cannot be penetrated because of what? Because they have given themselves up to lasciviousness. And they have reached a state where they have, they're covetous. And they're doing anything. They'll sink to any matters to have whatever it is that they desire. Their mentality is, is what is yours is mine, and I'll take it however I can get it. They live by the iron rule. Another example we see that grieves the Holy Spirit comes from there, verse 22. That ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to deceitful lust. There in verse 22, we see that they have been allowed themselves to be controlled by the old man of sin. They have corrupted themselves with their former lust. They have been deceived by them. They have gone back to that former way of life. They have forsaken God. They have uh, allowed their former life to get a hold of them and control them yet again. But then we skip down to verse 25, and we see that they, wherefore putting away lying, speaking every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. When one lies and does not speak the truth, what do we see there? That they are grieving the Holy Spirit, and we must speak every man the truth of his neighbor. Why? For we are members of one another. You know, the worst thing that we could say about someone is a lie. And when we lie, we grieve the Holy Spirit. But continuing further there, notice verses 26 and 27. Here another way that grieves the Holy Spirit. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Wrath can control us. Anger controls us to the point that that anger causes us to go out and seek to bring harm to other individuals there, and it causes us to give in to the devil there. Notice what he said in verse 27 again, neither give place to the devil. Control our anger and not allow it to control us. But then also verse 28, we read there, let him that stole steal no more. But leather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. So if we're going to grie if we are grieving the Holy Spirit when we have become a thief, we're stealing and not laboring with our hands. You know, work is good. It has been said from the very beginning that man must work, and that it is good for us to work. Never do we find that it is good for man to steal as, as so that we can have to give to him that is in need. But then notice there another thing that grieves the Holy Spirit. It is found in verse 29. There it says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. What is corrupt communication? If we've spoken of lying... We also think about the language that we use. If we are using our speech and we're using language which is unpleasing and unacceptable, we are grieving the Holy Spirit. The use of profanity and, and lying and gossip and all of these things here would be included in that. But then we skip down to verse 31, some things that grieve the Holy Spirit. Bitterness, wrath anger, clamor, evil speaking. Put these things away from you with all malice there. We must put those things away from us and overwhelm us because these affect our attitude towards our brethren, toward our neighbors, and ultimately toward God. To avoid grieving the Holy Spirit, notice what we must do there in verse 32. To be kind to one another tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sakes, hath forgiven you. Thank you for this question.
Thank you. Now, Brother Evans, we have this question. Is it taught in the scriptures that rich men cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven? Brother Evans. The answer to that question is no. It, that isn't taught, that rich, man, uh, rich men cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. Well, that being the case, what is taught? I want you to notice with me Matthew chapter 19 and verse 23 with the words of Jesus where he said, Verily I say unto you that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus here speaks to the fact that it is hard, as he said, or difficult for a rich man to enter heaven. What did he mean by that? Well, we better understand the words that Jesus spoke on this occasion when we look at the context and see uh, to whom he was speaking and about whom he was speaking. And he is speaking with one here often referred to as the rich young ruler. And this man was rich. He came to Jesus with a question. Good master, what good thing might I do that I might inherit eternal life? And Jesus begins to tell him the answer to uh, that question. And, and he does that by referencing some of the commandments uh, from the Old Testament in Exodus uh, chapter 20, among the Ten Commandments. He says, Jesus said, Thou shalt not do murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother, uh, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And this man replies to Jesus, All these things that you've spoken about, Jesus, are things that I have kept or I have done from my youth up. Then he asked Jesus a question, What lack I yet? Jesus gave him the answer to that question. He said, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. When the man heard these words from Jesus, the Bible says that he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Well, here we notice the reason why, perhaps, that Jesus said that it is difficult for a rich man to enter into heaven. Not impossible, but very difficult. Because many rich men have difficulty putting their riches in the proper place in their lives, putting their riches in the proper perspective. In many cases, those that are rich tend to put their wealth and material possessions in front of God. But passages like Matthew 6, 33 teach us that we need to seek the kingdom first. And we need to put God, number one, in our lives. Not those material possessions or riches that we may have accumulated in this life. And we need to realize of anything that we do own or call our own in this life, those blessings have come directly from God. Uh, but some people have in, an inordinate affection for those things material, and it seems that this young man in this passage was one who did that. Uh, he did not want to sell his possessions. He had great possessions. He certainly didn't want to take those things and give them to the poor, and that's why the man went away sorrowful. He was not interested, it seems, in what Jesus had to offer simply because his possessions were more important to him. Now, I think about there are folks who are very wealthy today who misuse their money, who love their money more than they love God. But there are people who are wealthy who are the exact opposite. And they use the means and the blessings that God has given them uh, to serve God. And I believe that there are going to be many people like this who are wealthy who are in heaven. And we're speaking of people who are wealthy, but they kept their wealth in the proper perspective. Uh, maybe they, are, they had a lot of money, but they used their wealth to help others. Maybe they used the wealth that they had to spread the gospel to people all over the world. And the money that they did have and that God blessed them with and the blessings that they had, they were good stewards over that which God had given them, given them. And I do not believe that those people will be lost. I believe those people will be in heaven. But I also believe what Jesus said. Uh, it's very difficult for a rich man to get into heaven because sometimes uh, people who have wealth let those riches get in the way. Thanks for the question. Thank you. We've reached the halfway point of our program today. We want to offer you a free tract. This tract is entitled, Where Are the Dead? This is a tract that is of interest to so many people. We'd like to put it in your hands. If you'd like this free tract entitled, Where are the Dead? Or if you'd like to study this correspondence course along with your Bible in the privacy of your home, we'd like to send it to you as well. All of our materials are free at a Bible answer. Or if you'd like to send us your question, just contact us. You may write us at Phillip Street Church of Christ, 912 Phillip Street, Dyersburg, Tennessee, 38024. 
You may call our toll-free number 1-800-436-0463 or you may email us at a Bible, a Bible answer at earthlink.net. We also want to remind you of our presence on the internet. You may go to www.abibleanswertv.com and go to our webpage and you can view past episodes of A Bible Answer there on our YouTube channel. So please note that presence on the web. Back to our questions today. To Brother Young, this question. Is cremation acceptable unto God instead of burying? Brother Young. There is no scriptural prohibition regarding uh, creation, or excuse me, cremation. Uh, Amos chapter 2 verse 1 is sometimes cited as an objection to it, but that refers to a spiteful desecration of the bones of the king of Edom rather than to a normal funeral practice. Uh, there are many people who object to it. There are many people who find it uh, distasteful. It may be dis distasteful to some uh, because of association with pagan religions, although not everything done by unbelievers and those who are in religious error is wrong. Some of it is just indifferent, and that's what cremation is. Uh, some may feel that it uh, conflicts with a belief in the resurrection, uh, but there is no problem with uh, the resurrection, whether a person is, is buried in a tomb, uh, interred in the ground, or uh, is cremated, uh, the body will return to uh, the elements of the earth in, in any case. In Revelation chapter 20, beginning verse 12, and I saw the dead, um, uh, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up uh, the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man, according to their works. Uh, resurrecting the dead will be no problem to the God uh, who created uh, man uh, from the dust of the ground. Uh, he'll be able to uh, resurrect us no matter where the body is or what condition uh, it is. Cremation is uh, simply a matter of personal preference and judgment. Thank you. Thank you. I know a lot of people are choosing cremation today. I recently participated in a celebration of life service for someone who had passed away, and uh, they had chosen to be cremated. And as I stood there at the podium, before me was the urn in which the man's ashes lay, and it was a St. Louis Cardinals urn. I had never seen one before. He was a Cardinals uh, fan. Thank you for that good answer. Our next question to Brother Brown. Brother Brown, how are we ordained to eternal life? Acts 13, 48. Brother Brown. Thank you for this question. This is a good question. I want to make a few comments before we read the passage of Scripture. And the first is this, that according to Calvinism, this verse says that if you are one of the elect, no matter how you live or what you do, you are ordained uh, unto eternal life. Uh, the, no matter what you, your type of lifestyle you live, that you can't control that. But I believe we're going to see from this passage of Scripture as we back up and begin reading about verse 45 and continuing on, we're going to see that the opposite uh, of that is true, and we'll make some comments about that after we read this passage of Scripture. Beginning there at verse 45, But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed, and the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region there. And so what we see here is this, that, that the Jews rejected the gospel being taught. The Jews would not hear it, so Paul and Barnabas turned to the Gentiles, 
And they were glad, verse 48 tells us, they glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. Does that mean that some had, no matter what they did, they were ordained to live eternally and others were not, no matter how good or how bad they were? That's not at all what Paul is saying here. What he is saying is this, that those who were ordained or appointed or destined to eternal life, that is the one who has obeyed God. Notice there verse um, 48, that last word in the verse there, they believed. Let's remove that word and put in its place obeyed. Those who were ordained to eternal life obeyed. Who did they obey? They obeyed, or what did they obey? They obeyed the preaching of the gospel. They obeyed the preaching of Paul there. And so the one here who has been ordained to eternal life is the one who has obeyed God. God did not arbitrarily decide that, that you would be saved and I would be lost no matter how good I am and how evil you are or vice versa. God has said those who meet the qualifications, those who respond to the Lord's invitation in obedience to it are ordained to eternal life not some arbitrary decision made that you and I have no control of. After all, God has made every one of us free moral agents. The one who is ordained to eternal life has obeyed the gospel from the heart. He's heard the word of God preached, Romans 10, 17. That word preached has produced faith there, as Romans 10, 17 tells us. He has believed that Jesus is the Christ, John 3, 16, and so many other verses of Scripture. He has repented of his sins, Luke 13, 3 and 5. He's confessed his faith in Christ and that before men, Matthew 10, 32, Acts 8, 37, and been baptized in water for the remission of sins. Having done that, he must now live faithful unto death to receive a crown of life, Revelation 2, 10, 2 Timothy 6, 8, James 1, 12, and following. And when he does that, he's remained faithful to the Lord. What, what has taken place there? He has been ordained or destined, determined, or appointed to eternal life. Another point that needs to be made here, he can forfeit this appointment to eternal life if he so chooses. But if he remains faithful and after his obedience to the gospel, he has been ordained unto eternal life. Thank you for this question. Thank you, Brother Brown. To Brother Evans, we have this question for you today. Did God create everything in six literal days? A lot of people wonder about that. We'll give that to you, Brother Evans. Yes, this is what the Bible teaches from Genesis chapter 1 and 2, where we find the creation account. The Bible is God's revelation to man, and so it was, wouldn't surprise us that in the very first verse we find, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And he begins in, this, in these few first words of the first chapter of the Bible to describe how he created the universe. And God called the light day, verse 5, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day after he created light. And then he created the firmament in verse 8. And the, after creating the firmament, it says, and the evening and the morning were the second day. In verse 10 of Genesis chapter 1, it says, God created dry land, and it brought forth grass and herb yielding seed. In verse 13 of that text says, and the evening and the morning were the third day. And so it seems pretty plain to me that in Genesis chapter 1 here is God is describing the creation of the universe that these were literal days. And so why do we have this question? Well, of course, there are those who are evolutionists today who do not believe that God created the universe. They believe that the universe came about through a Big Bang explosion and that we evolved and would have us to believe that we evolved from monkeys uh, and uh, such like. And so then what you have are those who are called theistic evolutionists who try to combine the two. They say, we'll take a little bit of the Bible, we'll take a little bit of evolution, and we'll see if we can't reconcile them. And to do that, they've tried to make the six literal days of creation eons of time to facilitate the evolutionary doctrine which has billions uh, of years in it. Now, there's some things we need to realize from the text here in Genesis 1 that we need to recognize that defeats this, and that is in reference to the word day that we are reading in Genesis 1. It comes from the original Hebrew word yom. And every time this word yom appears, the word day in our English translation, except in prophetic passages, when that word yom is used with a number, it refers to a literal 24-hour day. 
And also as we're reading the text here, as days are described, they are separated by a day and night, which is indicative again of a 24-hour period of time. Also, the days are equally divided by light and darkness, which are another indication that they're 24-hour literal days. You know, if these days represented eons of time, can you imagine what it would have been like in creation? There would have been millions of years where it would have been nighttime, and how could have the plants survived in such a situation? Uh, the very notion is ridiculous. We just need to take the Bible for what it says. I serve a God who is powerful enough to create the universe, and he did with a spoken word. I did not come from a monkey, and neither did you. Uh, we came from a God who created us and who loved us enough to send his son to die for us. And I am thankful that he has given us his word that tell, tells us the important answers to many questions we seek. Where do we come from? Why are we here? And where are we going? And we find the answers to the first of those questions here in Genesis chapter 1. Thanks for the question. Well, thanks so much for that good answer and for all the good answers that we have had these last few weeks on a Bible answer. We appreciate so much the efforts these brethren have put forth in answering these questions. You know, uh, I guess it was yesterday that I was watching this program called Mountain Men on the History Channel. And there was this couple that I was really fascinated with, older couple. They lived in the mountains of Montana. And they were showing how they had to prepare for the wintertime in, in late summer and early fall, and they would nearly always run out of time, and all the things they had to do and all the wood that had to be cut and, and the produce brought in. The nearest grocery store that they had was 100 miles away, and they would have to make that trip and, and gather up as many supplies as possible in order to survive the winter in the snow. In Proverbs 10 and verse 5, it says, He that gathereth in summer is a wise son, but he that sleepeth in harvest is a son that causeth shame. That basically is a verse about the need to, to be prepared. The prosperous farmer spends his time in the proper season getting ready for the cold winter months. We need to make our preparations for eternity. If you made the preparation that the Corinthians made in Acts 18, 8, Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all of his house, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. Have you done that? If you haven't, let us know. We'll be glad to help you. Thanks so much for watching A Bible Answer. And remember, for your Bible questions, there's always a Bible answer. We would love to hear from you, our viewers. If you have questions for A Bible Answer, or if you'd like any of the material offered on this program, please contact us at the address on the screen. We appreciate all of our supporters, and we encourage you to worship with the faithful Church of Christ in your area.